Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. Thanks to netdania.com for providing the charts. You can click the link below. This is the four hour chart and you can see the descending trend line that I had drawn here in this flag or pennant formation. And you can see we just just touched out of it, just broke out of it, the follow through of yesterday's rise based on the Euro Ponzi bailout. And I'm going to be getting into some of the controversy that's come about because of my criticism of the some of the spending habits in the EU and Britain. Anyway, so this this breakout here is yet to be really followed through with. The other trend line that I've drawn is one that goes from the semi-recent top that we had at 44, and this is going to be our next target. Of course, our next major target before we get to that is going to be around $34 because that's going to be the overhead resistance it was the support line that held you can see normally your support lines are lines where you have breakouts of the price so you can see we broke out here we broke out and failed there and then we broke out here then we had a lot of consolidation and a failure right there at that price so 34 is a key price we need to get through that and we need to get through this high this most recent high and these are the price points we need to penetrate for our move up to the next level so we're looking at 34 is the next level we want to get through then 35 and 3 quarters and then we want to get through 37 or so to confirm an uptrend now there's been quite a bit of controversy about what I said about the EU and Britain. I want to clarify, first of all, I'm not criticizing people and their jobs in Europe and people's jobs in Britain and anything like that. And I don't have any objection to the British or the EU nations, whether it's Finland or Norway or whoever it is. I, I don't object to them having any kind of system that they want. I personally believe that socialism is a failure, that it is a system that has very seriously damaged the prosperity of mankind. It has hurt an enormous number of people, and it's ultimately, it, it results in poverty. That's my personal belief. I think I have a lot of evidence to back that up. I would say I tend mostly towards the von Mises school, the Austrian school, so I'm very opposed to socialism. Be that as it may, if a country wants to be socialist or a state wants to be socialist, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I just hopefully don't want to be forced to live there, and if I'm not forced to live there, I don't want to be forced to support them because, in my opinion, that's a system that is going to be bankrupt by the nature of it. So. I wanted to jump over to some of the controversy and one of the comments that was on the threads was talking about basically the premise was this that well we need to have higher pay and benefits than you do in America because we have such higher prices especially for petrol and things like that so that just got me thinking and one of the reasons it got me thinking is because we really only have two types of oil in the world. We have You have the North Sea Brent and the West Texas Intermediate. Now that's very interesting in and of itself that the Anglo-American Empire would have the two types of oil that are traded in the world. But that's a whole other issue. This article is from, actually from today, in the Telegraph. And the question is, why is petrol so expensive? and the answer of course is because of tax now if you think about this you would realize that it makes sense why should the price of oil or actually gasoline I mean there's refinery costs and things like that but why should the price of gasoline be that much different anywhere in the world it really shouldn't because there's a world price of oil so barring things like logistics and barring things like refinement costs and things like that most people should pay pretty much the same amount of money for their petrol as they do anywhere else. Now, when we look into this, we find out the reason why is fuel is heavily taxed. 
with levies accounting for the majority of the cost of petrol. Successive gov now this is the UK, but it applies. I'll, I'll show you in a bit that it also applies to the rest of Europe. Successive governments have applied above inflation rises to fuel duty. The average price for a liter of unleaded petrol on British forecourts is 123 pence. Of this, 57 pence is fuel tax, 18.3 is VAT. Well, the actual cost of the fuel is only 47.71. Now, it even gets worse than that. In the case of fuel, the tax man takes a double cut because VAT is applied to the cost of the petrol inclusive of the fuel tax. So what that means is that the fuel really only costs 47 pence a liter. There's roughly 3.75 liters in a gallon, so you're talking about roughly, say, almost two pounds or so. So pretty much the base cost is close to what we pay, but the base price is going to be this 47 pence, and then they're going to add this 57 pence fuel tax on it and it's going to give them a total of 100 and something and then there's going to be a VAT tax which is a percentage sales tax so when you add it all up we'll go to the next chart when you add it all up it comes to roughly two-thirds of the cost of petrol in Great Britain is tax now you can see that if you add here in these charts here and this is a very good uh, site it's called energy.eu and I will put the link down below so you've got the columns here you've got the FOB the FOB is the price of crude oil just the bare price of the oil the margin is going to be industry margin that's refining transport insurance stockpiling distribution to petrol stations and sale to consumers What's interesting when you look at that is that if you look at this price of oil, 52, I think this is in euros, so half a euro, the and that's per liter, the margin is really very small. It's really only 0.1. It's essentially a 20% margin. If you look at the excise tax, now the excise duties and value-added taxes are taxes levied by government, so you have a tax and then in, in almost all of Europe you have a VAT tax as well. So you're going to add this together and this together and then add that VAT tax on top and then you're going to get this retail price. Now if we go down to the price for the UK because that's the one that we're looking at you can see that we have 51 plus 10 is roughly 61 and then we have these taxes added on top which is going to be 68 plus 26 which is roughly 94. So if you take this 61, divide it by 94, you're going to get roughly two thirds. So 60 some, 65, nearly 66 percent, nearly two thirds of the cost of petrol in the UK is tax. And that would make you wonder, well, what exactly does this tax go for? And this article is a little bit dated it's January 2010 but it is a expose of the state of Britain's roads and the spending on the fuel tax and the key line that really stands out here is that it turns out that the majority of this tax is actually not spent on the roads this AA president Edmund King said motorists are getting a bad deal on the roads they're paying a 44 billion pound fortune in motoring taxes yet only a small portion is spent on the roads the pothole roads are falling apart and need urgent action now we find out some of it's spent on bridges and other things but it, I could not find and track down if anybody knows and can find a breakdown of where the tax goes for all of the fuel taxes in Britain what it's actually spent on and be very interested to know but I couldn't track that down but 
I'm going to take this guy's word for it that only a small portion is actually spent on the roads. So that's a perfect example of the failure of socialism. Now, why do they say these taxes need to be so high? Well, they're going to tell you all kinds of crazy stuff about carbon emissions and green taxes, and we need to discourage driving and all this stuff, which I think is just outright silliness. But this is a perfect example of the socialism that's taken over Europe and how people try to justify further wage increases taken from the taxpayer in the part in the case where it's government workers but others are unions striking etc so we have to have higher and higher wages to pay higher and higher taxes and of course it just never ends it actually ends in complete bankruptcy and that's what we're seeing in Europe so that's my defense of this issue that it's not a problem with the currency and it's not actually a problem with the petrodollar and it's not a problem with anything but taxes that governments enormous taxes two-thirds taxes which is just confiscatory tax rate and that's why you have such a problem there so hopefully that can be put to bed I just simply have a disagreement with the socialists in Europe I have I'm perfectly willing to let them live their lives in peace and harmony and do whatever they want but I certainly don't want my currency to bail out their bankrupt socialist experiment going on over there now I wanted to read the latest from Ted Butler because it's really an excellent commentary I'm not gonna read the whole thing I wish I had time I'll try to get through as much as I can Ted Butler is really the grandfather of the silver conspiracy story and the silver fundamental story and you'll see here Ted does an excellent job this is from a couple days ago of summarizing the whole thing and it's called the long view with more financial uncertainty in the world than in memory and with price volatility going through the roof it's hard to think about the long term the only problem is that our lives are still measured in the long term in financial terms starting families raising and educating children preparing for retirement and preserving hard-earned wealth are not day-to-day -day considerations we are forced to look ahead in looking and planning ahead there is no crystal ball no guarantee that things will turn out as we expect all we can do is to make assumptions based upon what we know now and then try to position ourselves for what may come imagine that you are going on a journey for 10 years and will be out of touch for the time with no short-term trading allowed what assets would you choose to invest in until you return silver is an asset that can offer spectacular returns and preserve value with low risk it is a vital resource and essential industrial material in addition to being a precious metal and because so few investors are familiar with real silver the real silver story it's a near certainty that silver will become more appreciated over time I absolutely agree and I'm doing everything I can to make that be the case there are limitations on the future supply of silver every metal resource in the world becomes more expensive to produce each year that's due to the growing cost of extraction and because ore grades have declined the biggest and cheapest deposits have already been found and exploited the grades for silver ounce per ton of ore 150 years ago at the Comstock load were hundreds of times richer than the grades being discovered today it takes greater effort and expense to extract metals from the earth to say nothing of the new environmental restrictions the world population now stands at seven billion over the next 10 years the world will add another 750 million and perhaps a billion people on top of that over the 20 years that's six times the equivalent of the current population of the US that will most likely be accompanied by an increase in the standard of living throughout the world one measure of an increased standard of living includes greater use of electrical appliances electrical devices of all types from TVs refrigerators washing machines computers cell phones since silver is the best conductor of electricity it is sure to be in greater demand plus silver has other important attributes it's the best reflector of light the best transfer agent of heat and has important biocide properties making it indispensable to modern life silver performed better than any other asset over the past decade but don't buy silver because it did well buy it for new forces in place in the world ten years ago there was no net investment in silver only in the last five years has the world taken to investing in silver over that time over 600 million ounces of silver have been bought in exchange traded funds with hundreds of millions of additional ounces of silver being bought in coins and bars 
Five years in a worldwide investment movement is a very short time frame. In per capita terms, the world only bought one-tenth of an ounce of silver per person. It would be accurate to suggest that a worldwide movement towards investing in silver is in its infancy. There is more investment capital today than ever before. Between the banks, large investment pools, and hedge funds, that capital base is more concentrated than ever. We are talking about many trillions of dollars. All the silver bullion in the world is valued at less than $35 billion. Despite silver's great investment performance over the past 5 to 10 years, it has yet to attract investment from these big concentrated pools of wealth. It is only a matter of time before the really big guys wake up and make a move into the metal. Considering how little silver exists to accommodate them, the effect on price when it occurs should be explosive. One thing that doesn't exist 10 years ago is the growing unease over government debt. For the first time in living memory, sovereign debt in the developed nations has come to be questioned and shunned. This is not going to go away or be resolved easily. It is not hard to imagine the distrust of growing paper, paper growing. A distrust of paper is a distrust of someone else's promise to pay. The only escape route is to switch to assets not dependent on someone else's promise or ability to pay. Silver is a premier example of such an asset. The kicker with silver is that without any rush from paper assets, it will still be great. The growing distrust of European sovereign debt is occurring at the same time there has been a rush to deposit money in government paper obligations and insured bank accounts. Given volatile stock markets, a troubled real estate market, and broad economic malaise, people are voting for safety despite historically low returns on deposits. Investors are flooding the banks with deposits that earn little or no interest. Money is piling up on the sidelines like never before. In due course, it will seek better investment returns than the near zero returns currently offered on insured deposits. Silver will attract some of this money. Either will come out of this economic mess and all the money currently flooding into the banks will increase industrial demand for silver or will slide into further distrust of paper which could set off a buying panic in silver. In either outcome it's hard to see how silver won't be the place to be. And I don't have the time to finish so I will go ahead and link that for you. Now I wanted to, speaking of that, I wanted to show you on my channel I have linked my blog and it has a link for the Ted Butler archives so if you you can click on the website here and it's named uh, domain brotherjohnf.com or you can also click on the banner silver for the people and it will take you to my blog the blog is a little bit different format than the YouTube page now you can see I've I've done some activity here. It's a lot easier for me to add content and make comments and things like that because it's uh, creating and processing videos is a lot of work. So it's much easier to just add a comment to a blog and or link a video or link an article. You can see that I have linked the recent interview with Andy Hoffman on SGT Bulls channel. I've uh, linked a link here to uh, Christopher Green's Greenwave TV and uh, there's the latest Jim Willie that's linked here and my last update is there. So it's something that I can just spend just a little bit of time and point you to what I'm looking at. The other thing on the blog is a blog roll which is the links that I I generally tend to use to stay informed uh, th these are going to grow because I have a lot more links than this but you can see I've and th these will all pop into a new window so you can just close them I've got the Jim Willie archives here these are all going to be in alphabetical and I mentioned uh, the Ted Butler archives those are on there there's a link to Silver Seek and there's a link to the futures charts so pretty much any of the links that I use to stay informed and stay on top of things I'm anytime I find one and I've forgotten to link it I'll go ahead and link it here so if you want to get to my links and want to get to the sources that I'm using to get my information you can just go to my blog and click those links so back to the price of silver we are watching it very closely 
we're trying to break out of this flag formation and we're going to see if we get to the next support levels. I think we probably will. I don't think what we just had is a QE3 because markets are backing off, but it's probably the next best thing to QE3. I think eventually that silver is going to rally and take out 34, 36, 37, and on our way back up to test the $50 point at some point. So in the meantime, you probably want to keep stacking because you might not see these prices again for a long time. We just don't know, so you just keep stacking a little bit each week, and that's the best strategy you can have, and we'll talk to you next time.